Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Jonathan Blow. Hi, oh good, the mic's working. So uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to the Penny Arcade guys for inviting me. Um, but you know, when I came here, I didn't exactly know what to talk about because you know, when I was figuring it out, I was like, oh, it's story time. What does story time mean? That sounds kind of special. Like, how do I do something special, right? Uh, so I look back at a bunch of previous uh, keynotes that people have done. And a lot of them would sort of talk about the old days and how they grew up and like what video games were like and like how cool the Atari 2600 is and everyone would go like, yay, Atari 2600. Uh, <laughs> and that's all true for me too, but you know, I feel like you guys have seen that a lot, uh, especially if you've been to a lot of PAXes. Who's been to a lot of PAXes? Who's been to like at least three? So, so I'm gonna do something a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna play some games because PAX is about playing games. Whoa, there's too many slides. So, um, I want to play some games that I like, uh, and I want to explain to you like why I like them, because some of them seem kind of weird, and they're the kind of games that people are like, oh, why would you play that, right? So, uh, but I don't think that's too odd, you know, I, like I like music, I'm not a musical expert by any means, but I like listening to bands and stuff, and I've got some favorite bands, and I remember I would go pick up a magazine and read an interview with one of my favorite bands, and they'd talk about who their favorite bands are, and it would always be like weird stuff that I didn't really know about and didn't really understand why people would listen to. So this might be like that, but hopefully, if I do a good job, I'll at least communicate a little bit of why this stuff is cool. All right, uh, so the games I'm going to talk about are also um, not really the most uh, popular ones. I guess that's implicit in what I was just saying. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is this game, Thousand Spikes, which um, I would not have even known about if I hadn't been at PAX a few years ago. At PAX Prime, uh, a company called Nicholas was exhibiting their remake of this game called Thousand One Spikes, which is what I'm going to be playing here today, and you can get it on all kinds of platforms if you're interested. Um, they port stuff everywhere. Um, but this original game, Thousand Spikes, uh, is what I'm going to be referencing because all the levels I'm going to be playing through are in that original um, game, which came out some years ago on Xbox Live Arcade indie games. So it was instantly buried among all the like, other Xbox Live Arcade indie games. Um, so it's an obscure game. You know, if you play it, you might not have heard much about it besides like, oh, this is supposed to be a hard game. And uh, when you start the game up, this is the first thing that you see. Uh, stage 1-1, one uh, dude times a thousand, right, if you can't read that. And it's, it's kind of funny immediately because it's like, wow, that's really excessive. I have a thousand guys. And then it hits you like, wait a minute. If I have a thousand guys, it means I need a thousand guys. <laughs> What's going on? So it's a good joke because it's also serious, right? And this is also a callback uh, to this, right? If you played Super Mario Brothers, like Mario times three. So it's kind of saying like, oh yeah, you think that's a game? This is a game, right? Um, and this is what the game looks like. <laughs> I'm actually going to play that level. Uh, but first, um, let me play uh, an earlier level so I can show you guys what the game is like. This is what people call a, a massacre platformer, which I guess is a game where you have to be kind of masochistic to play it. Um, so let me play a sort of an earlier level. Um, you know, so I'm this dude in the lower left corner, and I can run back and forth, and I can jump. I actually have two jumps, which is a really interesting design decision. I have this sort of low and slow jump, and this high and fast jump. And in terms of dodging obstacles, it matters, uh, you know, which one of those I use. It's actually very critical. Uh, and then I can throw daggers like this, right? And so I just sort of start playing the level, and it's ah, things start collapsing under you, and ah, spikes pop up that you didn't expect, right? Um, so I've played this level a bunch. Most people die several times by now, actually. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've played this game, so I kind of know, I know that I need to high jump here to go past this dagger that's going to shoot at me from the left. Uh, and that that pops out, and um, oh, I forgot about that though. <laughs> so let me try this again. I was like taking a moment to figure out uh, what I was going to do, and that's a brutal mistake. Oh God, that's a brutal mistake in this game. All right, 
I got to at least get through the this level because otherwise the next level is going to... Okay, let's wait. I could have made that, but... All right. I'm being very cautious now. All right, so now uh, to get to the right-hand side of the screen, I've got to move this block over there, which, of course, the first time you're playing, you may not read that out, and you might get over there and kind of be stuck and then have to somehow get all the way back. So I'm pushing this block over, and here we have another joke because I've got to go get that flashing key on the right, and most people will just push this block into that convenient pit that's right there for the block to fall down, and you need that block to get out. So because I've died a couple times, I'm not going to do that. Um, but you see how that's placed right there. Like The designer knows that many people are going to do that. So I sort of do this, and whoa, oh, and get out. So that's, uh, that's not really worthy of applause, because that's a really easy level compared to <laughs> later in the game. Um, but it's also, again, um, when you first come to the game, that's actually a pretty hard level. And you see yourself improve quite uh, dramatically. So this level is uh, somehow earned the name of the game. Uh, it's called Thousand and One Spikes. And you look at it, and it's like, oh my god, what's going on here? Um, because prior to this in the game, you've seen you know, those individual one square spike units. And you're sort of learning to deal with that. And this is the first level where it's like, oh my god, there's this giant field of spikes. What the hell do I do, right? So you start looking at it, and you're reading the level, and you're like, OK, I'm in the lower left. And uh, I kind of see a safe spot there, sort of toward the bottom middle of the screen. So that doesn't seem too bad, I guess. I've got to just time it. I'll wait till the spikes are up. And I'm going to sort of jump in there and run over there. And then maybe to give myself extra time, I'll kind of jump out of the spikes again. So I'm only standing in the spikes for a second, right? You formulate this kind of plan as a player. So I'm going to go like, oh, and run and jump. I didn't really need to jump at the end there, but thought about it, right? So now I see a similar situation, but it's evolved a little bit. I see another safe spot over on the right, but there's a bunch of spikes again, about the same amount as I already went through, and I don't have a jumping head start this time, so it's maybe a little harder. But then there's also spikes above me, so if I jump at the end, maybe that's a little harder. So uh, I'm just going to run for it. Uh, by the way, most people die several times by now. It's just I, I know the timing because I've, I've played this game a bunch. So now there's no question of jumping. There's like spikes coming at me from both sides, but I've got a nice safe spot there at the end, and I'm just going to go there. Uh, OK. So now I've played this game a bunch to know that this thing to my lower right between those red spikes is the exit of the level. And I'm right there, and I'm looking at my left, and I'm like, oh my god, that's so many spikes. What do I do? And, but there's a block here, and like, can I push it? No. Can I shoot at it? No. So this block is like kind of a joke placed there by the level designer. It's like, don't, don't you wish you could push this block, right? Or if only. But you can't, and so you have no choice but to go back to the left. Now I've got to do something hard. It's like, oh, crap, there's a bunch of spikes there, and I have to jump upward into them. So instead of gaining time with the first jump like I did on the left hand of the level, now I'm losing time in my upward jump. Uh, so. That's scary, and hopefully I use the right jump, because if I use the wrong one, you know, the low jump, I'm going to end up in the wrong place. So I've got, I'm timing it, and I'm timing it, and I'm like, OK, no, no. All right, let's go. Wah. It's kind of scary when the spikes like do their first pop up. So here, um, now I've got to do a similar thing. I've got to jump out at the end, but this time the place that I'm jumping from is in the spikes. So it's actually a little bit harder because if I jump, if I jump too far, I'm going to land in those spikes on the left, right? If I use the low jump and I don't quite jump enough, I'm going to bump my feet against that ledge that I'm trying to jump onto, and I'll fall down into the spikes, right? Um, and if I jump too high, I'll hit these spikes over my head, right? Because the high jump takes me straight into them, right? If you're an expert player, you're thinking about the low jump uh, because it's safe here. So, um, you know, again, I'm going to make it look easy, but uh, it's easy to die here. So now, this is the first time, uh, th there's a subtler joke here, but it's like, OK, I'm seeing this row of spikes to the left. And so far in this level, the pacing has been that I'm finding my little resting points, my safety points. And there's not a freaking safety here, right? It's that place, there's a block there where the safeties usually are, and it's not safe. So I'm like, oh my god, what do I do? I guess the game is just expecting me to run through all of these. I guess maybe I can if I do it well, if I time well. So I'm going to jump into it maybe and run as fast as I can and jump out at the end and hope that I make it. And I, I might die, so uh, all right, that's not too bad. All right, so now we got to get up here and get up to that safe spot up there. And again, there's, there's spikes coming down from the ceiling. And it's a more of a vertical jump, which maybe makes the time 
uh, tougher to, to read. So uh, I'm just going to go there. All I have to do is make it to the safety, right? This is no problem. Oh, God, it broke. <laughs> ah! So the game's a little bit unfair, right? <laughs> um, but that's what makes it fun. So you start over again, and maybe I'm a little better at it this time, right? Because I've played the level a couple times, and you know, maybe I'm a little bit nervous and about the timing still, but I've learned. I've learned a little bit from the stuff that I've done. Stopping here and waiting, stopping here and waiting, you know, running. So now I know, okay, that's going to collapse probably unless it's randomized, which it isn't. So it's going to collapse. So I don't know what to do. I could try running straight through there, but it looks like a lot of spikes. Um, I'm going to try a strategy where I stop. Uh, I wait till the spikes start coming up. I stop on the block and then I keep going, right? So let's, let's try that. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Oh, God, there's no safety here. Oh. <laughs> Right? So what do, you, what do you do? What am I expected to do there? Um, I don't, I'm looking at that as I start the level again. I'm like, oh my god. Uh, it looks like there's a safety right above me here, but there's actually some spikes that are popping up. Am I supposed to make it all the way over there and time that? Or, you know, I dodge the... Oh god. I didn't mean to die there. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got to get through this. All right. Too much talking. Talking and playing is hard. All right. Oh, I almost died there. <laughs> All right, so stop. And I jumped once, so maybe I can keep doing that, right? Oh, if I don't fudge the timing too bad. And I realize I have a sort of a transcendent realization at this point. Like, wait, there was this much space all earlier in the level that I played. And if I can jump a bunch here and sort of bide my time, I could have done that at any time before. And so maybe these spikes are not as terrible as they seem, right? Which is kind of cool. So now here, I know I've got to get that key. I've played this level a bunch enough, this game enough to know that. And I've got to push this block, I guess, to reach the key. Now, there's a skip in this place if you have actually uh, know this game. But I don't like the skip, and it wasn't in the original game, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, so I've got to actually push the block and jump out and push the block and jump out and get the key. And then I need to exit the level to the right. So I need to push the block and jump and push the block and jump and push the block. And I could just jump in the air instead of going there. So now I might die here. But uh, if I do, I won't restart because this is not that germy into what we're OK. All right. So that's that level, right? Um, and uh, just to show the flavor of it, um, actually, let me, let me do a clean restart. I'm going to do a clean restart and try and blast through as quickly as I can, just to show the point and stage presentation. So if I die, it's whatever. You know, even the best speedrunners die. Uh, but I just want to show the difference between like, how, how this level might feel like the first time you play it, and then how it feels uh, when you really jam on it, right? So it's like those first spikes almost aren't even there. And then I'm jumping at those spikes like, oh, god. I almost, oh, OK. I blew my run already. I was supposed to not stop there. Boom. And then I'm going to wait for this and push to the right. And then I'm just going to fly, right? Oh. oh. Anyway, you get the idea. So it's a cool game. I, I really love this game. Um, now. Here's sort of a diagrammatic view of all the ideas that are on the level, right? Um, or the things that I had to do or notice or think about in order to play it effectively, right? So I sort of, you know, made a little three screen, pan back and forth. There's about 14 distinct things. If you go to a finer level of detail, there's more than that, right? Um, and like I said, you're able to have this sort of transcendent realization about how easily you can move through these spikes. And in a lot of games, that kind of gaining of expertise is something that maybe you get toward the middle or the late game. You know, We have this idea that games will sort of teach you mechanics and you're getting better at playing them. And after you've played the game a ton, uh, then you, know, you might go back to the beginning and cruise through it. But with this game, it expects so much from you in one level that by the time you finish the level, you're a lot better at the game. Um, and that's kind of amazing. Um, it's a very high 
density experience, right? It's, it makes a lot of games feel boring and slow, right? Not just the density of, of improvement of skills, but just the density of ideas, of like little side jokes and cute situations and evolutions of the initial situation that the designer throws at you in this game, right? Now, a lot of AAA games these days uh, are, you know, they're designed kind of by committee, and they get focus tested, they get a bunch of players in the room to play it, and if anybody complains about anything, which believe me, when before games are done, they're like broken to hell, so people complain about everything, right? And if anyone complains about some piece of gameplay that doesn't work, they tone it down or, you know, whatever, make it easier. Um, so we've got this world where AAA games tend to be heavily tutorialized at the beginning, they're afraid of players dropping them or, or bouncing off them, as they say, right? And um, it, it, it just makes a lot of these games really tedious, right? Whereas in this game, it's doing the same kind of thing where it's teaching you how to play, but it's not even tutorial. This is the actual game, right? And every level in this game is like this on a different subject. It's very exciting to play that way. Um, and sometimes people ask me, well, two or three or, or ten, um, I don't know. It's a good time for a drink of water. Um, now, I've been talking about how this game is cool, and the, the problem that I have is it's a little bit like trying to explain a joke. Like, all these reasons that I've given you why that level is really exciting to play doesn't give you the experience of excitingly playing the level, right? It's like, if you didn't speak English natively, and you, you kind of spoke it, but you were from a different country, and you came to the U.S., and someone was telling a joke at a party, and you don't have the subtleties of the language down, and you don't have the decades of experience uh, of living in the culture here, then you might not really get the joke, or you might understand it logically, but you don't really feel like it's funny, right? And that's sort of the problem that I have is, uh, it's hard to, both with this game and the other ones I'm going to show, it's hard to communicate the essence of it, right? The, the feel of it, you really have to play it. Um, so I encourage you to try these out. So, you know, I showed that diagram with all these uh, goals, and I want to reiterate that this is not just a set of stuff you have to do to win the game or to win the level, right? It's actually a stream of ideas that the game is sending at you as you play, right? It's a line of communication that's constantly flowing between the game and the player, and is not particular to that game or any of the other ones that I'm going to show. All games have this kind of line of communication, but, you know, some games focus on it more or use it uh, in a higher density way. And, um, I, as a game designer, am very excited by this kind of line of communication because, um, you know, I think of video games as an art form, and I bet a bunch of you in the audience do as well. And with any particular art form, there are things about that form, there are nuances that make that form what it is and different from the other forms, right? So if you're a sculptor and you're designing a work, you don't just think about like, oh, this is like a model of a person in 3D that you could see from all these angles. Like, obviously, you think about that. But if you're a master sculptor, you know a lot about, like, the different kinds of stone and how light reflects off them. And if it's a translucent stone like marble, then how light sort of transmits through it and lights the sculpture up from the inside and from behind, right? Whereas if you do drawings, then you're a lot more concerned with things like, uh, you know, the thickness of lines and the curvature of lines relative to each other and the way the ink behaves as a fluid while you're drawing, right, which is something that a novice person probably doesn't think about at all, right? Or the way the texture and color of the paper affects what the ink is going to look like when it's on the paper, right? So every medium has a bunch of this stuff, and well-understood mediums that have been around for thousands of years, we know really a lot of very nuanced things about them. Um, but games are really new, right? They're just a few decades old, and I, they're really complicated, and so we don't understand very much about them yet. So as a game designer, what I like to do is pick out specific things that I don't feel are fully investigated and, like, really drill down on those things. So, you know, just a few months ago, we made this game, The Witness, and uh, this <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, this game, uh, when we started showing videos of it, you know, it, it looked really weird to the world at large. It's like, what? There's a bunch of weird panels that you, like, trace grids on, and what is that? And why would anyone play a game like that for, like, hours? It looks stupid. It looks like a trivial game, right? But in fact, it's, it's not. Um, 
the panels in this game are uh, a, a substrate for communication, right? What we do is we present this interface, uh, like here's how you interact with the game. You draw on these panels, and then we pick a bunch of different situations in which we can communicate different kinds of information in different ways. And because the substrate of these panels is like a neutral canvas, it allows us to go to many, many different places uh, in terms of the flavor of communication, in terms of exploring the nuances of that communication. And so the game as a whole is then like a study of different flavors of this communication. Um, hopefully, the word study seems kind of boring, so hopefully it's a more exciting and interesting to play uh, study. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, uh, I mean, maybe this is a little redundant at this point, but this level, I think, is really amazing. Like, it, it's, it's my favorite level, probably, of any game ever. Uh, and I, I'm not the kind of person who gives compliments lightly. Um, anyone who can design this, and I don't mean like copying this level in your game, but like if you could sit down and make an original game and design something like this with this many different variations on an idea and this many different uh, just little twists and turns and evolutions all in one place, then you're just a virtuoso game designer. Uh, maybe it's a little early in the history of the medium to be calling people virtuosos. We might not e even be able to do that, but um, this is completely amazing, right? I just, I just want to say that. All right, new game. Uh, this next game is called Miegakure, and I'm going to play a short uh, video for you that explains uh, what the game's about. It's a, it's a four-dimensional game, and the video will explain to you. It's about three minutes long, which will give me a break from speaking, and you a break from hearing my voice. Miyagakure is a 4D game, a game where there is a fourth dimension of space. So I thought I would show you what it would actually look like if you could walk through walls using the fourth dimension, and in the process explain what the fourth dimension is. So say you need to get to the other side of that wall, but you can't jump over it, and it's been replaced by a pile of rubble in the middle of the desert. Okay, before I continue, let me explain something first. So say you are this 2D character and you need to get to the other side of that wall, but you can't jump over it, and, um, well, that's about it. But what if there was more to this world? What if the world was actually 3D and you were just a 2D flat character that could only move inside a 2D plane? You could go past that wall by just sidestepping it, but how do you do that since you're stuck on a plane? So you press a button to turn sideways, and now when you're moving left and right, it doesn't mean the same thing. It actually means moving along the third dimension. So you take a few steps, and you press the button again to face the original way, but now you're in a parallel world that is further along the third dimension. So the wall is not in front of you anymore, it's off to the side, and you can walk right past it. You can notice that some rubble must have fallen off the wall in the third dimension also. You turn sideways and take a few steps to get back to the world you came from, and turn back. Okay, but this little 2D character is only 2D, so unlike us, he can't see the third dimension. So what does he see when he turns sideways? He might think the world is deforming, but it's just what it would look like if you took 2D slices of a 3D object, like images produced by an MRI machine, for example. The world isn't changing, it's just being seen from different directions. So when he's further along the third dimension, down in the desert world, he can't see the wall, but he can see the rubble. And from the sideways perspective, he can move across worlds back into the grass world. But back to thicker problems. What if the world actually had four dimensions, but we could only see three? In other words, what if we were living on a 3D plane inside a 4D world? So you press a button to turn sideways. And now, when you're moving this way, it doesn't mean the same thing it used to mean. It actually means moving along the fourth dimension. So you take a few steps, and you press the button again to face the original way. But now you're in a parallel world that is further along the fourth dimension. So the wall is not in front of you anymore, but off to the side, and you can walk right past it. And you can notice that some rubble must have fallen off the wall in the fourth dimension. You turn sideways, and take a few steps to get back to the world you came from, and turn back. And this is how you walk through walls, using the fourth dimension.
Okay. So maybe that was easy to follow. Maybe it wasn't. Um, this game is not out yet, but I have a preview build here, uh, which I will play now. And uh, just don't, you know, it's somebody else's game. The, the animations and graphics and all that aren't final, so let's not judge it based on those. <laughs> let's instead judge it by how, how cool uh, the gameplay is. I mean, it, lo it looks beautiful anyway, but I'm just, just disclaimering. All right, so here's a level that's kind of early in the game. Um, it's, uh, it's not so early that I don't know what to do, right? I know I'm this guy, and I can sort of run around, and I can jump, and I can jump up to surfaces that are about one block above me. Um, and I've also learned by this point that I need to solve each level by getting to the exit, and the exit is that red uh, square sort of over there under that gate. So I need to get there, but it's across uh, some water, and if I try to jump, then I really can't jump that far, and I probably knew that, but in case I wanted to test it, um, that was my experiment. So, but I also know that I have this dimension shift capability that you saw uh, in the video, again, which is not really about traveling, it's about rotating your viewpoint so you can see the world from other angles. So I'm going to do that, um, and I do that by pressing the circle button here, and I've got this shift happening very slowly at first, but I can speed it up by uh, letting go. And you can see actually that the world uh, that I was standing in is actually just one of a layer of three worlds kind of stacked on top of each other, right? And I can go look at them in turn. Uh, you know, let's look at, this is the one I came from again, which has got this kind of stark uh, wall across this water. And uh, here there's something with a wooden block. That's kind of interesting, right? So here's a kind of a, a barren place with an even more problematic wall, but it's got this wooden block, which may be useful to me, right? And if I come over here and look, here's some placid place with a water wheel and stuff. OK. Now, this is kind of cool. As I dimension shift, you can sort of see inside the building. Whoops. You can see the interior of the building in various slices as you go, which actually uh, turns out to be important later in the game. Um, anyway. I know if I'm going to use this block, so let me make a plan, right? If I had that block in this world, um, then it could be resting on this one square where I'm standing and jut out one square toward that other block, and hopefully that'll be enough for me to get across this gap. So I can go to this middle world, right? Find this block, and um, it looks like I can't really do much with it. I can push it forward, but not to the right. But this obstacle here is only in this world, right? If I go to this view across worlds, you see that that space is clear. Um, although that's actually not, actually, the space that matters is actually this space <laughs> where I'm standing. Uh, and that's clear. So once I've wrapped my head around sort of the four dimensionality of things, um, I can make plans like this. So I push the block this way. And I'm going to push it to the side. So this direction that I'm pushing it now is a fourth dimensional direction that I can only see because I'm in this special privileged viewpoint right? that normal human beings do not have. So I've pushed it into this bottom world. And now it's here. And now I can push it along a regular third dimensional direction that we're used to. And I've made a platform for me to easily jump across unless I die, which is not a particularly hard jumping game unlike the last one. All right, so that's a really interesting um, set of situation already, right? It's sort of the basic uh, scenario that the game sets up, is that there's four dimensions, and you can shift your viewpoint around between them. And by the way, there's blocks you could move around. And there's a lot of other stuff later in the game, but we, we don't need to talk about that, because just blocks even is very interesting. So with that, you can not only make really interesting and challenging puzzles, but you can also make kind of jokes or quirky situations, which is a, a little bit of a higher level expression, right? So let me uh, look at a level that's like that. So this is not too much further in the game. We're still concerned with pushing around blocks. And I first get into this level, and it looks uh, totally trivial. Like, what? there's an exit up there. OK, it's too high for me to get to. But I know I can jump up things that are one block high. So if I just push that block two squares over, so it's below the exit, I should just be able to jump on the block and then jump out. And that's, that's all fine. Why don't I just do that? So I come over here and try to push, and it won't move. 
And I'm like, what the, the hell? There's nothing there. Why doesn't it move? But again, so if I rotate my view to be across dimensions, I can see that this block actually spans across the dimensions, right? Geometrically, it's a one by one by one by two block. And in this other world that it extends into, there's these little rock outcroppings that are blocking it and this shady character who's hanging out. Um, so here I can't push it. You can't really pull things in this game, right? You only push. So obviously I can't push it either direction here through the rock and I can't stand inside the rock uh, to push it away because that's impossible. So you have this really kind of funny situation where um, this level is absurd upon first sight, but then it's not because it looks trivial, but it isn't. Um, but if this was the only world that exists, it would be a total trivial, dumb level, right? If this world was the only world that existed, it would be a completely impossible level. But because there's a mixture of the worlds, because this block spans both of them, um, then the level's actually interesting and you can solve it. So uh, I can start solving it by pushing this block away, right? That character is puzzled because he can't see me because I'm in a different world. So the block, as far as that person's concerned, just moved of its own volition, which is really weird. So back here, you can sort of see what I'm doing now. I've, I've freed this block from its confines and I can start pushing it around th this obstacle that was blocking it. Um, if I go back into sort of the dual view, you'll see what that looks like. And then if I go back into the original world where I started, um, you'll see that I'm getting closer to my goal. And from this point, I can just sort of stay in this viewpoint because uh, you know, there's nothing blocking me. And then I can get up quite easily. So, um, there's a thing that really fascinates me about this kind of game. Um, it's not just, you know, it's a puzzle game. It's got, you know, we say as players and as developers that it has new game mechanics or whatever, which means that you're doing stuff that you don't necessarily do in other games. And all that is really cool. But uh, what is the most exciting to me about this game and games like it is that it's built a world, it's built a system uh, out of these rules, right? It's asked a what if question. What if the world actually was four dimensional and you had ways of seeing into the fourth dimension, right? Um, this has a, a very long tradition in science fiction, and I don't necessarily mean uh, this kind of science fiction. Oh, we don't have the slides up, really, but I don't necessarily mean this kind of science fiction. Thank you. Uh, which is sort of what's also called space opera, where there's, you know, spaceships and other cool weapons, and then the heroes have to go on adventures to save the day. All that stuff is totally cool, um, but there's an actual older tradition, which also goes by the name of speculative fiction, uh, going way back to this uh, book, Flatland, that's from like 1884. So science fiction is actually really old. It's actually older than that. But the Flatland is, is one of the books that uh, sort of informed Miyagakure. Um, some of my favorite authors uh, these days who write speculative science fiction are guys like Ted Chiang and Greg Egan. Um, but the thing about science fiction is that ultimately it's, it's just stories. And I don't mean to use jest too belittlingly, because there can be really cool stories, they can really grab us and take us places and be very exciting, right? But at the end of the day, how good that story is is not that related to whether it's true or whether, whether it's a real world. It's more about how convincing the author is and how deep their thought was in their skill as a writer, which are all very important things. But in games, we have to work harder. We have to build a world that actually works, right? Um, it's a lot easier to write a story about what if the world was four-dimensional and you could see into the four dimension, and then accidentally not think about all the, uh, all the uh, natural consequences or get some things wrong, which is very likely to happen, right? Uh, anyone who's ever written software knows how easy it is to have a bug. When you're trying to write a story about a world or a system, this is the equivalent issue, right? It's almost impossible to get it right. But in a game, you have to get it right because you're building a system that has to function, right? And on the one hand, that's a lot harder than writing a story, and so it's kind of brutal if you're a game designer. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's also just really, it feels really good when you, when you make one or when you play one because 
you've managed to make something real, really meaty, like it has some level of existence that you can't really get just by talking about something. It's like an actual world. Um, and so that's very exciting to me. And again, the thing, you know, you could have something like Mass Effect, which is more like a space opera world that's not really talking about the laws of reality. It's just more like, what if you had advanced technology and aliens and stuff? But this kind of game is like, what if the actual physical situation of the world were different? And that's, it's like expanding the mind in a way that you can't really get other ways. And I really value that. I really love it. Uh, and so my last game, Braid, was uh, this kind of a game, um, speculative science fictional game, um, not really in fiction at all, but in the way it's posed, right? It's asking these what if questions about like what if uh, you know, you had the ability to uh, play with the flow of time in certain ways, and if that ability uh, went through different permutations as you visited different parts of the world. So we sort of are starting to have a tradition of this kind of game, and I really like that. Um, and again, I think that's valuable because it shows, again, that we have an art form with a lot of different uh, areas, a lot of, a lot of different sub-practices within the form. Uh, third thing I'm going to show is this game called Starseed Pilgrim, and I'm not going to say that much about it before I start it up because it's a mysterious game. Um, I'm going to play it on Steam where you could check it out. Uh, it's also on the developer's website. And this is how the game starts. This is like the whole tutorial that you get. Um, it tells you these arrow keys, and you realize like, oh, okay, I'm this little guy and I can break blocks. And there's sort of this void coming in which maybe is chasing me or feels like a timer. Uh, I'm going to instinctively just sort of get to the bottom because I can see that gap at the bottom of the level, right? On the way, I can sort of reveal this poem, um, which I'm not really going to spoil. And then I get into this, uh, another white void, right? And I guess I can break these blocks by moving into them. I test that, and I'm like, yep, that works. Uh, OK, those are floating. They didn't fall, so that's, that's interesting. To know. Maybe they'll fall if I do this. No. OK. Um, and then I see uh, you know, there's this weird block below me. It's like, what happens if I do that? Now, again, there's no other. This game gives me no other uh, hint or no other direction aside from the things I see on the screen. Right? It's just letting me try to figure out what happens based only on visual cues. So I could try doing this like to break those blocks, I bump into them. So I can try bumping into this thing below me. And I float up, and I'm in like another white void. And now there's a star down there at the bottom, and I'm starting to see these particles of, of the black void. And I'm like, well, what's going on? But here it gives me one more hint. It says you can press space. So I press space. And now there's a pink dot, and it's kind of there's a line. Uh, maybe oh, it's turning into a square. Uh, and then that becomes one of those blocks, right? I still don't really know anything. I'm like, eh, I'll hit space again. And that did a totally different thing, right? And then I hit space again. And it does a totally different thing. Um, and like, what happens if I, whoa, I fell, right? And I'm back here. And I hit down, and I'm back here and I'm starting over. So I'm starting to get a picture for what the flow of the game is like. Like maybe that's the overworld that I came from and m maybe this is like a level or something. And uh, that's a little bit of knowledge. It's more than I started with, but it's still not very much. So it's up to me to just start trying different things. Like, oh, I didn't put a blue one last time. What happens? It's sort of an arrow pointing up. If you look close and I real, oh, I can jump really high. OK, that's cool. Um, what does that do? I don't know. You know, what does that do? This weird, sickly yellow color. I don't know. Oh, I like can't really jump while I'm on it. Uh, I can't even jump to the top of this block, so that's Maybe I want to stay away from that one? I don't know. Oh, there's a star above me. And also one below. Like, what, um, what do I do? And so my process of play, uh, you know, I'm just sort of saying questions like this. 
And that's what playing this game is. It's this cycle of having a question and uh, trying something and sort of maybe getting an answer back from the game about what happens when you do that. And in this way, we're sort of learning the system of the game uh, without being tutorialized beyond these few hints. Um, by the way, at the bottom, it has this thing about pressing H. Uh, and I don't want to spoil the game too much. If you're interested in it, I'd rather just let you experience it because it's a really wonderful game. If I hit H, it just does the same thing as if I fell, it sends me back here. Um, so uh, this kind of a game, Starseed Pilgrim especially, I realize I'm just rattling off the name of the game very quickly. It's Star Seed Pilgrim. Um, this kind of a game, um, some people find very exciting. Like, I totally love it. Some people find it a little bit frustrating. Like, they'll play a game like this, or this kind of comment came uh, also uh, on The Witness, right, a few months ago, which is some people will play the game and say, I didn't have a good time because uh, the game didn't tell me what to do, or it didn't do a good enough job to communicate, or it, it failed to make me enjoy it, is a sort of a comment that I hear, right? Um, and if you're sitting down and you want to just play a game like you watch an entertaining action movie, then I can totally see that. But, um, you know, sometimes I want to do that with a game, but often I, I don't. And so I really appreciate a game like this. And so um, I was thinking a little bit about that kind of reaction that some players have, and, and why do they have it? Like, why do they presuppose it's the game's fault uh, if, if it's the kind of game that expects player initiative? And, and the conclusion I came to is that the game's a little bit ahead of its time. Um, and I want to compare it uh, to another game that I played a bunch, uh, Counter-Strike, right? So if you've ever played Counter-Strike, it's a very hardcore shooter, uh, multiplayer, and if you start playing this, if you just drop in, uh, it's probably a very frustrating game. Or if it's not frustrating, if you cope well with it emotionally, it's at least uh, difficult, right? Because you're getting killed a lot by all these other players who have played a bunch, right? And that's, that's hard. And, you know, you get ideas about how to do it better, but they're not enough better, and you just get killed again, and you get killed again. But you play this game a little bit, and you start succeeding and improving. You maybe pick a couple of guns that you're used to, and you learn how the bullets come out and how fast they come out, and you, like, learn how many shots you can fire before your aim goes wild, and you're starting to get a little bit of expertise at the game. And when you do that, it starts to become more fun, because, like, hey, I actually shot a guy. Wow, that was cool right? Oh, I can kind of now shoot guys with some regularity, right? Not always, but I'm getting it, right? And then as your uh, skill at the game improves, um, you get more of these fun moments, but there's also this compelling loop, like, oh, I thought I, you know, because you keep having frustrating times. Like, oh, I had fun, but then, oh, I thought I understood something, and it didn't work that way, or this guy came out of a part of the map that I didn't know existed. Like, I thought I kind of knew this map, but there was this little cubby hole up here, um, so you have this cycle of good times and bad times and good times and bad times. And Counter-Strike, a lot of the time, really is not classically fun. But it's a really fun in the sense that people really love the game and really like to play it. Uh, so what I want to say is that a game like Starseed Pilgrim is similar, but with a different set of skills, right? Um, and I'll, in a second, I'll sort of say what those skills are. But, you know, you start the game. And you might get lucky and try a lot of the right things and figure out what's going on relatively quickly. But if you don't, it could be a frustrating game. Just like if you get shot a lot in Counter-Strike, it's frustrating, right? If you're failing to progress, that's a thing that human beings find frustrating. Um, but again, like Counter-Strike, when you do a lot of the right things and improve your understanding, you get into this cycle of fun. And the problem happens uh, when people never get into that cycle of fun. They sort of give up or, uh, you know, have too unfortunate of a time and never get there. And they just look at the game and say, oh, this, this isn't working for me. This is not a fun game. The game sucks, right? Um, now, I think that the reason that there's a difference in attitude between those two things is there's a cultural difference, right? If somebody's not good at Counter-Strike and they get killed a lot and they sort of want to give up, Maybe they wouldn't have even played the game in the first place even because they look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's a game with Twitch skills. Uh, that's not my kind of game. You know, I'm not really good at those shooting games or whatever. You know, I'm going to go play Dota or something, right? Um, with games like 
well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me talk about what the skills are, because it'll make this a little more of a salient point. Um, so what, do you, what, do you, what skills do you need to play Counter-Strike? And what, what skills do you build by playing it, right? How do you improve? Well, there's Twitch skills of aiming really quickly and dodging. Um, you have uh, like short-term tactics like conservation of ammo, uh, you know, learning really when it's worthwhile to shoot and when it's not, and when you can spare time to reload and when that's a bad idea. You learn caution, which is sort of a general uh, a good thing for human beings to learn, right? Um, like I've been in situations like this before and I thought I had it in the bag and it just went really bad. So I'm going to be careful here. And um, you learn a lot of uh, strategy that at first seems context specific. Like, oh, I know on CS Italy, if there's a guy with a sniper rifle up in the window going down the long hall, then maybe I want to go around the other way, but there's usually a guy on the bridge, so then we need to have someone, you know, et cetera. Uh, but I think that once you do enough of that, it sort of boils over into a more general skill, right? You get a little bit of like actual strategic thinking that's widely applicable to the rest of life. So it's, it's good to play games like this in a sense. I don't, I don't know if I like practicing headshotting people all the time, but in, in many dimensions, it's good. Um, a game like Starseed Pilgrim has its own set of skills that are different. And the reason I say there's a cultural difference is part A of that is I think that they're not as widely recognized. So um, what kind of skills do you need to be good at this? Or what kind of skills do you build by playing it? Well, the ability to do self-driven exploration, to have ideas of what to try next and to go execute them, right? That's not, like sometimes we think that that's like an inherent personality trait, but I think it's actually something learnable. Uh, you need to be able to recognize patterns like, oh, last time I put the purple seed down, uh, this one thing happened, and now this slightly different thing happened, but it's very close to that last thing, so what, what's in common between those two situations, right? Um, learning from the experiments that you do, uh, Perseverance, um, which again, like caution and Counter-Strike, actually, Counter-Strike also teaches perseverance. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and here I mean perseverance in the sense that like, okay, if you're not really, if you're not really uh, succeeding, try again, but maybe try again in a lateral way. Don't just keep banging your head against the wall, like be smart about it. Um, and again, just like Counter-Strike, you learn a lot of context-specific game rules. Now, part B of the cultural difference is I think that uh, these kinds of things, like these kinds of things, uh, when people don't really have these skills or they're, they're not as good at them or they're a little rusty, um, they don't really identify with these that personally, right? So they're just more like, oh, shooting game, I'm not, I, don't, I don't like those, it's not a big deal. These kind of skills, I think, go a little bit deeper, right? Because, like feeling like you're not a self-driven explorer is almost like a value judgment of you as a person, right? Um, or, uh, you know, it's almost like, are you smart or not? Because the game sort of feels puzzly. And I think when games feel puzzly, they remind people of stuff like IQ tests or SAT tests or something, right? Of school, all this school stuff that is very unpleasant experiences, right? And it kind of brings up this feeling of judgment and we feel judged sometimes when we play puzzle games and we're not really succeeding. And so um, I just want to say, if you've had this kind of experience, or you know someone who's had this kind of experience, um, I think it's a, it's a temporary cultural artifact. I think um, we'll get beyond it before too long. Uh, and, and maybe I'm a little bit wrong about, about the source of it, but I don't think that, um, you know, I think being stuck in a game like this is a natural part of play. It's just like an old school text adventure game. You'd play those and you get stuck all the time. Sometimes you get stuck for stupid reasons like the parser is bad, but um, you know, usually, hopefully, it's because you didn't know the solution to the puzzle, although often the puzzles were bad. Games these days are a lot better. Um, but so if you're, you know, if you're stuck in this kind of game, it's not really a personal judgment by the game, but I think some people feel like it is. But that's also exciting. Oh, it was a, the whole reason I went off on that tangent about judgment and SAT tests and stuff is this is exciting, though, because it reveals like another dimension into which we can go with the art of video games, right? If you can kind of do things that subliminally bother people and they reject a game and they don't exactly know why and you don't exactly know why, it means we're really getting into people's mind in a way that's deeper 
than uh, the usual kind of like, oh, we're going to just be addictive or, or whatever, right? It's interesting. And that brings some kind of power that we don't know how to use yet, but hopefully we'll figure out how to wield it effectively and with responsibility, right? So, and with that, I'm going to talk about this last game, uh, Steven's Sausage Roll. <laughs> some of you have heard about this game. Uh, this just came out uh, on Monday. So you can go uh, try it uh, if you are so inclined. It was in the works for years. And the reason I'm showing it to you now is it is possibly the greatest puzzle game ever made in the history of puzzle games. Uh, that's not, and I'm not the kind of person who like, puts out accolades lightly, like I said earlier. Like Some people are just like, oh, it's amazing. And oh, this other game is wonderful. I don't say that stuff. But this game is amazing. And it's worth your time to look at. So, uh, and again, I don't, it's a very spoilable game. I mean, in some sense, not really, because there's so much game. It's huge, and there's so many ideas in it. But I just want to talk about, um, I just want to show you basically how it works, really, and then talk about why I like it. Um, where is it? It's in Steam. Oh, and we have to uh, pause for a moment and sort of enjoy the, the title screen. It's the best part of the game. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, let's get serious. So the, the barbecue sauce slot has my finished game that I'm not going to mess with, but we're going to start a new game. Uh, I don't know whether the kid... Who, who wants ketchup? The ketchup game. Who wants mustard? Okay. That's good, because I would have been a mustard person as well. It's just a nice... Uh, yeah, anyway. So, um, I'm in this land, and one of sort of the common themes of all these games that I've shown today is that they let you self-guide, right? They don't tutorialize you to death. And this game is just like that. Like, it's told me nothing so far. I hit the arrow keys, and I sort of realize I'm this weird little dude who can walk around. And if I come abreast of these things, I get, like, little one-sentence things. Like, OK, arrow keys to move. I guess I knew that if I could get here. Uh, Z to undo and R to restart. So I can hit Z to go backwards. Boop. And I can hit R, and I'm starting over where I was. And that's all I know. Um, but I see these sort of weird ghostly outlines that are sort of kind of like my shape, I guess. Uh, so I can go over to one of them. You might fumble around more than that, because I happen to know even moving in this game is complicated, and I happen to know how to do it. Uh, but I see these, oh, I pushed a sausage onto a grill, and it kind of got cooked on the bottom side. And now it's cooked on the top. And oh, now it's burned on the bottom, and then I dropped it in the water. So uh, the game wants me to restart, so obviously that's a fail, right? Um, so the way, the way this game works, as you find by a little bit of experimentation, is that you need to cook all the sausages. And you need to cook them on both sides, because nobody wants an uncooked sausage. And there's sort of uh, two, you see that the game is sort of grid-based, and each sausage is two grid squares long. So you've got to sort of cook four grid squares versus worth of sausage. But you have to do it only once, because otherwise you'll burn that part of it. Um, anyway, I've played this game a bunch. So again, I'm going to make it look easy, but sort of what you can do here is spread the sausages out so that they're two abreast. And then you can, oh, I burned it. <laughs> that was just me hitting the key too many times. So basically, that's how you win a level in this game. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to play a few so that you get the idea. Uh, so like, here's, oh, I got to turn around, because my, my fork you know, sometimes is hard to maneuver because it bumps into obstacles. And that's a big part of the gameplay later. Um, so here's one that looks easy. It's like, OK, I guess I could, I see that grill square on the right, and I could push, push the sausage over there and push it forward, and that'll cook one side. And then I just, that, those two squares on the left will cook the other side. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to cook it. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I can't push the sausage to the left. Like, oh, that's no good. I could push it to the left if I could stand one square closer to it, because I could sweep my fork over and push it. But I can't. So what looks like a really simple level is actually really complicated. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe, OK, if it's here, 
I can push it back. So maybe I'll do this. And I've got like a quarter cooked sausage and maybe I'll do that. But then it's like, oh, now I'm stuck because I can't walk on the grill. It hurts my feet. So, um, you know, what you eventually uh, find is that in this very simple level, this is a tiny, by the standards of most games, this is a super minimal claustrophobic level. You actually have quite an interesting solution where you end up pushing it here, you push it there, you got to walk backwards because if you walk forwards, you'll push it off, right? So you got to walk backwards and come around, and then I scoot this guy to the right, and then I scoot him over this like I was talking about, and then I swing my fork around. So now the sausage is halfway off the grid and I can never pull it back, so uh, I had better be done with that half of it, but I am, and so I get that half and it's cooked, right? So it's a... Uh, that was not, uh, that's not worth the plot because, I mean, it's true, if you start playing this game, it might take you 20 minutes to figure that out, but like later levels in this game are crazy compared to that. Uh, so anyway, let's do one more. This is a very happy pool. Um, and you know, this is a slightly different looking level, and of course the danger is, uh, you know, if you push the sausage the wrong way, it'll end up in the drink and nobody likes a saucy sauce, a soggy sausage, especially if it's undercooked. So, you know, you eventually sort of, it's another sort of exercise in just figuring out what to do with the sausage and how to push it. So even in this uh, seemingly weird pathological situation where there's two diagonal grills, you can sort of figure out the laws of how the sausages work in this sausage world and master it, right? So all that's very cool. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm not going to show anything else. Um, but the reason I'm showing you this game, like I said, it's the, maybe the greatest puzzle game ever. And uh, again, it's like trying to explain a joke, but I can say some properties of it that are cool, right? In this game, you're like trying to figure out the laws of this sausage world and apply them. Uh, but you're also perceiving the ideas behind the structures of the level. So as you play through the game, you notice that you're in these individual levels all the time, and each level has a specific idea. And that idea is usually very, very focused, or at least you can usually tell that it's very focused. And after a while, you get that pattern, and you're like, oh, OK. Um, if I enter a new level, because it's so focused, I can usually read from the geometry of the level what might be the idea. right? And so you're actually, as a skilled player, engaging deliberately in that stream of communication between the game and the player that I was talking about, right? I mean, all games have it, but like I said, some games are more focused on it. And in this game, that stream comes through the design of the level, right? If you see a ladder going up two squares where you could stand on the top, you look at that and go, there's a reason I stand up there. I need to do that. Why? What, why would I need to stand? Oh, OK, it's so that I can do this other thing, right? And the last thing is, again, like Thousand Spikes or many of these games, um, it's a very high density experience that's 100% pure, right? This game is not that worried about if you get it or if you're keeping up or if it's too hard. It just goes. It's like, look, man, I've got a ton of stuff to show you. And the bus is starting now, and it's going. So you're either on the bus or you're not on the bus. Are you on the bus? And I love that. It's like it's the way some of my favorite works of, <clears throat> of fiction are as well. So um, the, the, one, the biggest thing about this game is surprise. Uh, in the sense that what I showed you, uh, like all these games, what I showed you was a very simple set of ideas at the core of the game. Like, okay, there's sausages, and you've got to cook them, and you can't overcook them, and it seemed very simple. What I just showed you seemed very minimalistic. How much of a game could you possibly get out of that beyond repetitions of what I just showed you? Wouldn't that get boring very quickly? And the amazing thing you find playing this game is no, for like, a long time, there's new ideas that just keep coming and coming. And this game is a tour de force in terms of doing amazing maneuvers to pull new ideas out of this sausage world without adding weird new objects or whatever, just with the few, uh, the, the premise. I'm a little character with a fork, and there's sausages uh, and blocks and grills, right? That's it. And it's amazing, right? So. Uh, if you can check this game out, I totally recommend it. And uh, I was going to take time for questions, but it looks like there's only 10 seconds on the clock. So uh, I don't know if we have an extra couple minutes or if we got to cut it. I'll let 
I'll let the organizing folks tell me that. I don't know where they are. Yeah. Okay, we'll take questions since there's nobody here to stop it. <laughs> Who, uh, I can't, there's microphones, right? Are there microphones? This is, okay. It's like one of those games where you have to figure out what's going on as you play it. Someone shout a question. I see a dude standing over here. Do you have a question? No. All right. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>